Hi, thanks to everyone for coming. It really, uh, it means a lot. I'm India. I'm one of the publishers of East Lari, along with Sebastian, who's somewhere back there. Um, and we have a whole, uh, a whole group of incredible poets and artists and writers and translators with us tonight, many of whom are from Ukraine or from Russia, um, as well as some of the editors of Art Forum who are here and who helped put this event together very last minute. Um, so thank you. Uh, and we'll be reading tonight from multiple works by Yevgenia Belarusets, who's a writer and photographer uh, based out of Kiev, as well as the poet Iakiva, who uh, is from Donetsk but lives in Kiev now, um, Zerhe Sedan, who's an activist and writer living in Kharkiv, and he's still there despite um, all of the shelling that's happening, uh, and uh, Mariana Kinovska, a Ukrainian poet in Lviv, who, uh, whose recent cycle of poetry is called The Voices of Babin Yar, which of course has new meaning at the moment. Um, many of the texts tonight were originally published in Ukrainian, and some of them were written in Russian. Uh, as you probably know, both languages are widely spoken in Ukraine. And while many of them address the war, they're speaking mostly about the uh, invasion into the Donbass that started in 2014 and is ongoing. Um, the one exception is Yevgenia Belarusets' War Diary, which I'm sure a lot of you have been reading. Um, she's been writing that every day since the war began from Kiev. Uh, we've been publishing it on Isolari. It's also an art forum. You can find it there. It's updated every day at 4 p.m. Um, and you know, it's already it's had an incredible impact. And I think all of the texts tonight are ones that can crystallize and um, really humanize what's happening right now and, and give some insight into that experience. I think in putting this together, it felt almost impossible to do anything at the moment um, and really difficult to know how to respond and what's appropriate. But uh, Yevgenia wrote in a re recent diary post that um, communication and representation of what's happening is is key and it's really only as part of a story or a narrative that we can understand the catastrophe and start to make sense of it and hopefully end it. Um, so I think you know tonight is about coming together, it's about hearing what's happening, um, but it's also about just being with everyone, people here, the friends and family who are in Ukraine and those who are risking uh, you know incarceration in Russia for protesting the war. Um, so Thank you for, for being here, and I'm going to pass it off to our first reader, who's a poet and Russian-English translator, Eugene Ostashevsky. He'll be reading um, a story from his latest translation of Yevgenia's work, which is called Lucky Breaks. It came out just this week from New Directions. Um, yeah, Eugene. Lucky Breaks, um, and I'm going to read a story uh, which is called March 8th, the, women who could, the Woman Who Could Not Walk. It's a story about International Women's Day, which is today. Um, so I thought it would be a good story to start with. This too can happen. In Kiev, on March 8th, 2016, I happened to witness an astonishing spectacle. A woman lost the ability to walk in the course of an instant. They say this woman was in perfect health when she proficiently, with a quick, agile gait, almost an amble, reached the central street, Pishati, relocated to the Maidan or Independence Square, and landed in the middle of a colorful holiday Crush. She strolled the square for a while, posed for a photograph with a monkey, bought beer at a kiosk, and in a show of benevolence offered the gift of a beer to a stranger, ate ice cream, repeatedly glanced at the souvenir tables, comparison shop without buying anything, eyed the clients of street cafes, and then 
just like that, suddenly without warning. No one saw it. There are no witnesses. We must take her at her word. She realized she could walk no further, performed the final unprepossessing leap and settled on a gray granite bench. She sat there modestly, keeping her perfidious feet to herself. She didn't telephone anyone, didn't trouble her relatives and friends. She just faltered and quietly sat. She was waiting for things to take care of themselves. I walked up to her and we began discussing what happened to her, why she couldn't move from her seat, as if she had grown one with a bench and her feet had all but turned to stone. The woman was categorically against any novel solutions and abrupt actions. She wished to sit on the bench a little, to ponder things, to turn things over this way and that, to wait it out, until she would finally realize what was happening to her. Only later, at some point in the future, after many hours, would she fall into a panic, scream, call her acquaintances one after another, demand to be saved, call the ambulance, and appeal to the mercy of passersby. A person carried three bouquets past the woman and threw one of them to her. He threw the bouquet as if he were throwing a bone to a dog, not venturing a word. The woman caught the bouquet mid-flight and brought it to her face in a grand gesture as if displaying her ability to inhale the smell of roses. Before we said goodbye, she found the time to tell me that today, on this one special day, people would turn their attention to women and try to do them favors. But on other days, women were left to languish without attention in some backwater, with no holiday in the heart and no sense of personal dignity. Then the woman smiled and confided to me that there's a certain secret she knows. Perhaps because of the secret, she had lost the ability to walk and gradually became an, an inalienable part of the granite bench. I'm a living monument, the woman said jokingly, but a monument that is soft, unstable and wobbly. This is why on such a day as today, I'm really not worth your time. She maintained that events of historical importance, so to speak, could be taking place all around her, but she would remain sitting on the bench and every so often try to rise to her feet with a triumphant smile. Cold and warm winds played with white and red rose petals, while the woman examined with undisguised interest those who are rushing around her, the other women and people. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Ustav Keen, who will read from a new orthography which is his new translation of Jadan's poetry published by Lost Horse Press. Hello, thank you for coming. I'm going to read two poems from uh, the collection which I co-translated with uh, John Hattis. Sunday School. The schoolyard leads to a riverbank. A priest is fighting with the workers to repair the road. The blooming of irises, a high sky over the river bank. The children look at the illustrations. The school textbooks note what's most important. The dead leave their coffins, like it's the subway's last stop. Jesus is on the cross, like a traffic cop at an intersection. No one gets what he really wants. The uh, 
The next one is uh, from uh, a cycle called We've Been Talking About War for Three Years. It was originally published in 2018 in Ukraine. A friend of mine volunteered. He came back six months later. Who knows where he was? He won't say what he is afraid of, but he is afraid of someone. Sometimes it seems he is afraid of everything. He left a normal person, but he talked too much about everything in this world, about everything he came across. And he came back completely changed, as if someone took his old tongue and didn't leave him a new one. So he sits in his bed every day and listens to the demons in his head. The first demon is ferocious. He pours out white heat, demands punishment for all the living. The second demon is submissive, talks about forgiveness, speaks quietly, touches the heart with hands covered in black soil. But the worst is the third demon. He agrees with the other two. He agrees, doesn't object. As soon as he speaks, the headaches begin. Thank you. Um, and uh, now uh, Eugene is going to come back and read uh, two poems by Iakiva. Um, Translated by Maru Mushtriva. Um, hi. So, um, Iakiva is originally from the Donbass, from Donetsk. Um, and she became a refugee in 2014, moved to Kiev. Now she's um, in Lviv. This is from the cycle People of the Donbass. Uh, uh, there's a number of poems in the cycle, I'm only reading two. Anna. We live where people used to keep cows in a stifling polyurethane sun. We make holes for love there. When the water is high, we walk on it. From the bed to the chair, then the windowsill. Then we hang like rags on the edge of light. Once we woke in history, melancholy. Can't fall back asleep, circumambulate like a child sobs in the dead belly. War, the worst day of my life. Tomorrow. They just came and shut the passage of flowering time into a nailed up victory box as if we were snow dying in the arms of cut down apple trees in the cesspool of guilt. Now my man and I go to get our pensions like cons off to roll call. But even there they say, special people live in Donetsk. Here you would say, and they're special gods. Occupation, the shimmering rhythm keeps trouble at bay. Silence, its dirty threads stitch up everyone's mouths with porous fingers of laughter from ear to ear. A train forgets itself and digs into the ground. It's making to remember passenger loves, doesn't know why it's here and what to do with so many names. Thanks. Val Vinokur uh, will read a short story from uh, Yevgenia's Modern Animal, which is the book that Isolari published last summer with her um, as part of our series. The translation is by Bela Shaivich. Thanks. It was it was my it was my great pleasure to edit this translation uh, last summer along with uh, India and uh, Sebastian. 
so this is uh, this is a section of the, of this book uh, that's called a small aside, um, and as you can tell, it's in it's in a, it's in a particular voice. Uh, In the 90s, I happened to play a small part in a few events. Nagorno Karabakh, Transnistria, I even had a fender bender with Afghanistan. Question is, who are we fighting? As soon as those Americans showed up here in Ukraine, that's when shit got real. I saw right fucking through them, writings on the wall. I felt a familiar breeze coming, the gray beard wind I'd rebuffed with all my heart back in the 90s. By the way, the Ruskies are always going to hate us. Hate us, despise us, humiliate us, and keep us under their heel, the bitches. The most important thing is to know which way the wind blows. The wind can be a death sentence. It can fucking kill you. I felt the wind coming on with a blizzard. Back then, I was driving a big old rig, sitting there like a fish in a fish tank. I was driving behind a little car, practically in its tire tracks, so that I wouldn't have to break my own road. Suddenly, I realized there were no more tracks. I'd been following that car like a dog, following scent. It wasn't trying to run off anywhere, it was taking the lead on its own. It was a little car, but it wasn't afraid of me or anything. I never planned on passing it. I was just creeping behind it, trying to stay in its tracks. And then suddenly, after the turn, nothing. The road goes on, but there's no car, no trace, like it fell off a cliff. I turned around. What happened? was the wind had swept the car down a hill, right off the road, and there it was on the grass. Not flipped over, but turned with its jaw pointing up at me. Help me, save me. It had no one else it could ask. I pulled it up out of pity, though I didn't have a minute to spare. And there was a tunnel ahead of us. What's a tunnel? Roughly speaking, a tunnel's a burrow with a hole in it. A car climbs into it, and then climbs out of it. The most important thing is not to start digging an alternate route. We climbed out of the tunnel, and the little car crawled off on its way. After that, I went on my own, straight down the road, five hours without stopping, the light hitting my eyes like buckshot. First, the cars on the other side of the road began to vanish. Then the outlines of the road, the turns disappeared, but I still leaned into them smoothly by rote, and only after did the vision start. I suddenly understood that I could see a black dog, a black dog by the side of the truck, running straight, quickly, deftly jumping over the road markings, spreading its paws wide. I nearly braked in panic, thinking I'd run it over in any moment. But it was like a circus dog, leaping exactly half a meter away from the car. It turned its head towards me and seemed to nod at the speedometer. We were going a hundred an hour. I realized that it was time to dismount. I spent a half hour at a truck stop drinking coffee waiting for my eyes to come back. That black-headed dog reappeared a few times. It reappeared in my life in order to save me. Was it because way back when we had put dogs on the last trains out of Donetsk? The stray ones from the shelter who had already started going hungry. We shipped them out and gave them away with every truth and lie. People were waiting for them on the platforms in Kiev, Kharkov, Lviv. And how much did you make in the war, soldier? Should I remind you, son of a bitch? I won't go fight this time. Not for this side, not for that one. What kind of war is it when no one even calls it a war? Only if tanks roll into Kiev, then I'll pick up my gun and go defend my house and my family. I'll stand on the roads into Kiev. I'll stand like a boulder. I won't let anyone get past me. Although, I'll still think long and hard about whether to come to the defense of my city or not. Everyone's been conned. And if they haven't been, they will be. They'll con them off the face of the earth, sell them out for money. What's a soldier? Why don't you go fight? I'll go in the end. I'll go fight this war. It's one ugly bitch, but I'll go. Jenya Turovskaya, a Kiev-born American poet and translator, will now read The Stars, which is a short story from Yevgenia's Lucky Breaks. Thank you, it's really um, such an honor to be here. I'm gonna take a seat. The Stars. The 
days drag on with no meaning. It's really quiet in A where we live. Nobody sh shoots at anybody. Nobody asks for explanations for no reason. Roadblocks don't work the way they do at B. Here, you can drive through a roadblock unmolested, especially if you are taking a jitney bus or taxi. I don't orient myself well in the city where I've spent my whole life. I don't understand who these people are, the ones I consider my friends, the ones I get together with every Thursday to play cards for small change while consuming a mountain of cookies and candy. What scares me most is stability. There's a quiet but an unsteady kind of quiet giving way, like a bog or a swamp. That's it, a swamp, not a soul around. I am searching for my husband in the forest in the middle of water knee deep. Did this happen to me? Or did none of it happen? You're going to laugh. It happened not to me, but to my neighbor. For some reason, I always find myself in her place when I tell her story. Don't chalk me up for crazy. I often have dreams that I'm by a line of trees, gallons of blood running everywhere, a cart completely covered with bodies. They're shooting us down, a firing squad. It must have come from a history textbook. I have nothing left to do but to climb into the cart hide under the bodies and smear blood over my face so that they count me as one of the dead. Whereas in real life, rather than in a dream, here's what happened. Last year, my neighbor went searching for her husband. They had taken him prisoner, but then they said they had let him go. She searched for him day after day for many days, and in the end found him in the forest. It took a while. She started in the nearby villages, then she searched in town, and then at his relatives' places, but they nonetheless learned very quickly how to see really well in the dark. And despite the cold, they learned not to feel cold. I learned that too. How hot my hand has become. A guy I know was riding his bike and saw them the way they were walking on the road, but he didn't stop. Many people say that the most important thing for us is to have peace, but I'm going to say to you that peace doesn't matter. Something else matters, but I don't know what. I just know peace isn't it. <coughs> While the war was going on, I felt calm because I was li living from one shelling to another. I wasn't living day by day, but minute by minute and hour by hour. My friends were with me. No matter what they talked about, their words lacked any kind of importance. In those troubled hours and days, their words were inaudible. Once uttered, they became objects, things, something solid and possessing form rather than meaning. Right on through the gluey green wall of rain, a neighbor in a blue dress ran to the entryway, ran to save a hen. They called the hen Vika. She survived the war, she became a victor, and so they named her Victoria. The neighbor survived too. The hen sometimes hid in the basement of our building. She would approach many of us, and she lost her fear of human beings. On one of those days, the neighbor announced that she couldn't bear it any longer, sitting below ground and guessing about what was going on above, with their house, with that bird brain Vika. We laughed at our neighbor, at her inability to sit still. Then the neighbor showed us a page from the paper, the town news, and there was a horoscope printed there for each day. Some signs were given hour by hour. It turned out that Pisces, could be sure of their well-being and safety from 3 to 5 p.m. that day. And so my neighbor, a pure Pisces, without any additions, could easily leave the basement. 
There might be rumbling somewhere up above, but nothing would touch her, almost for certain. Pisces kept Victoria company, and they had a good time together. Everything felt surprising to me that day, and I even believed the rumors it was Canada that was waging war against us over the discovery of new deposits of valuable coal. Some of us were already deeply convinced of the fact. We sat in the basement thinking about Canadian aggression, about how greedy, vindictive, and heartless other countries could be. Those bombs are made in Canada, the whisper swirled around the cellar, and for some reason we found it comforting. We all started to study the horoscope. Scorpio was safe tomorrow from noon until almost evening. That was how I went out for my first stroll. I walked around a city where, that was both smoky and bright. The streets were empty. The windows had no glass. The ground seemed to tremble a little while the thin trees curled down under the weight of their leaves. We've never had such quiet before. By the dumpster, I met an alcoholic I knew. He was totally sober. Like me, he stood there looking around in surprise. It turned out he was a Scorpio. Naturally, his instinct for self-preservation brought him up to the surface. I didn't encounter problems returning to the cellar. We started making calculations so that we may go into town during safe hours. Nothing happened to us, nothing special, nothing terrible, because we always went and came back in the breaks between shooting. These days, I too am reading the horoscope. Today, after six and until nine, I'm advised to seek seclusion and privacy at a time appropriate for reflection and best spent at home. This can be interpreted as saying the time would be unsafe above, believe it or not, with such veiled recommendations, the horoscope informed our whole building when there would be immediate danger to life during a shelling. The shelling has been over for a long time now. Still, the horoscope keeps giving the same recommendations, the wording unchanged, and we no longer understand it. The stars used to be on our side. You might say they work for us. Now it's as if everything has broken down. The sky does whatever the sky wants. Time has turned its back on our city. There's nothing happening. Margaret, who's been lurking for a little while now, is ready. Um, the, uh, she's reading from the War Diary, um, and just before this, Yevgenia has been talking about watching a video of a Russian soldier who is crying after shelling a city because he's, uh, he's worried that he's responsible for killing Ukrainian children and is sending a message to his daughter, but of course this is after the fact that he has carried out um, the attack. Hello, I'm Margaret Atwood. I'm reading from the war diary of Evgenia Bedorusitz from Kiev, and this is day eight. Many friends of my mother live in Chernyev. They were always proud of this small and clean city. I know that now, as I write this, the city is being shelled. An oil depot has been set on fire, and the small town, which was a favorite vacation destination for many of my acquaintances, is now threatened with ecological disaster. The danger comes from the sky. The houses are bombed. One begins to count the victims. Over the past few days, I've been wondering how obedience works. The soldier in the video cried only after he had obeyed his orders. That was too late. This war can be ended if the orders to shell homes are ignored by soldiers, even by generals. I know that sounds naive, but on such a day, naivety is the best shelter. The walls are not very thick, 
but it is deep enough. So far, 33 dead residents have been found in the rubble of Chernyev. Today feels particularly ominous. Almost every half hour, an explosion can be heard outside on the streets. The young woman living in the house next door is trying to rescue pets that were left behind. Perhaps the owners could not take them when they fled. She finds them comfortable, warm places and gives them food. An elderly lady who lives across the street goes shopping several times throughout the day so that her neighbors can stay home in safety. A well-known teacher, 86 years old, spends most nights in the basement of a school that is next to her house. Today she recorded a video in a distinct, almost forgotten, and noble Kiev accent she addressed the women of Russia. They should not let their sons go to war. It is snowing. The air is damp and cold, and it seems to me that I can no longer get close to my own city, the place where I live, whose events I witness. I resist the violence more than I used to. I resist acknowledging that the war is going on, that it is allowed, that it has been allowed. I can try to accept it. I can try to face reality, but then I ask myself, how will we all be able to live with the thought that these war crimes took place every day on our doorsteps? At some point, we will have to forgive ourselves that this inhumanity was even possible. But to really be able to do that, you have to protect the skies in my country. The bombing of homes must finally stop. Now there, uh, there are two poems um, that are going to be read by Oksana Maksimchuk, who's the translator for Mariana Kianowska. Um, and this is the cycle of poetry uh, that's about the 1941 massacre of Jews in Nazi-occupied Kiev. Uh, it's uh, about to be released by the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. And yet I will utter it. And yet I'll accept it all, by saying, not saying, like walking into the sea. War means an obscurity, a terrible dark of woe. It means a despair, a naked and piercing grief. I saw the Dnipro last night, didn't make it to the Dnipro. I watched from the distance its waters, its rolling waves. The yellowing leaves aflame and the ancient boats peaked with decaying planks from under the surface. White seagulls were searching in vain for a witness to their Anavian cries, mourning the dying town. I cried out non-humanly, stopped myself, bit my tongue, and now I will utter it. Presence is always twofold. We are center drilled beads. A bullet goes in and out, not once set apart. We are all of us strung together. Sun reaches its zenith as if it has risen up to witness us from above and how we are dying here. How we are meandering, watching the river flow because we get slaughtered. Aderka, Miriam, Debora, all lie in a ravine. I bear such a great woe. It turns heart to stone and makes the soul turn transparent. It grows ever thinner, and that means no less than death. Its being is twofold, for death really means together, with Deborah, Adelka, and Miriam, as far as celestial depth, as far as the Dnipros flow in the timeless ether. In the room there hung, in the room there hung, in the room there hung wedding dress, white and long. Now I put it away. Now I put it away. Now I put it away. For my David got killed. Einsatzgruppe zonder Kommando. Einsatzgruppe zonder Kommando. Einsatzgruppe zonder Kommando. 
an SS execution squad. We were happy, David and I. We were happy, David and I. We were happy, David and I. David and I were in love. In the morning, his mother came. In the morning, his mother came. In the morning, his mother came. Asked me if I already knew. Didn't know. Didn't sleep all night. Didn't know. Didn't sleep all night. Didn't know. Didn't sleep all night. Heard some shouts from the yard. I'm a mother no more, she said. I'm a mother no more, she said. I'm a mother no more, she said. May you, woman, be cursed. He's gone and you're still alive. He's gone and you're still alive. He is gone and you're still alive. That's your punishment, Virka. That's my punishment, Mama dear. So I sway and I sing a ditty, drowning out the shots from the yard, dying little by little. And um, next we're going to actually hear from Evgenia herself. She recorded this video this weekend in Kiev from her apartment. Uh, it's, a, um, it's her translation of a sonnet uh, by Eugene. And the original was a bilingual poem in English and German. So Evgenia mirrored that by translating it into a mixture of Russian and Ukrainian, which of course added a whole new layer given the war um, that was unintentional in the original but is now in the translation. Sonnet 14, Sonnet 14, Lied Leid. Omanu bolo te, що співали, когда пели лгали, печаль тому виной, так журбу сповивали. Была ли это печаль любви? Чи журба була жаданням кохання? Печаль любви лежиться бременем не тільки на душу, но й на тіло. Журба жадання обтяжує не лише душу, а й тіло. Душа глуха, душа глупа. Вона глуха, тому що не вміє говорити. Вона глупа, бо говорити не вміє. Це язик називає вещі від свого імені. Це мова дає речам назви від свого імені. В сущності він називає слова, не вещі. Власне, вона слова називає, не речі. Українська – це красномовна мова. Український язик півучий. Вона промовиста. Український язик виразителен. Значення в українському лежать у краї русского. Багато слів української мови скидається на слова російської. Що придається українському легкий нальот двойственності? Це надає українській легке сяйво двоїстості. Часто ти пишеш жадана, а читаєш омана. І now Eugene is going to read the English translation. Um, so, uh, this is the 14th of my feelings on it. Uh, it's in English and German. Oh, thanks. It's in English and German. Um, and uh, the idea was there's a line in Mandestam, Chasta Pishit Sakazni Chitaitsa Pravina Pesin, which means often you write uh, execution, except he's using the word archaically. So often you write suffering. Uh, but correctly it reads song. And I was thinking about that line and I was thinking how Kazin Pesin are similar in Russian, but they're not incredibly similar. Um, and I was thinking of German uh, Das Leid, suffering, and Lied, song. And I was thinking that maybe my, in, in a few of his poems, Mandelstam thinks in German. So I was thinking that this is one of those things and then I wrote this poem. Uh, Das Lied hat gelogen, the song lied. 
sorrow was the issue. Der Ausgang war Leid. Was it the sorrow of love? War es das Leid der Liebe? The sorrow of love burdens not only the soul, but also the body. Das Leid der Liebe belastet nicht nur die Seele, sondern auch den Leib. The soul is silly. Die Seele ist dumm. It is silly because it doesn't know how to speak. Sie ist dumm, weil sie nichts sprechen kann. It is language that says things in its name. Es ist die Sprache, die Sachen in ihrem Namen sagt. Actually, it says words, not things. Eigentlich sagt sie Wörter, nicht Sachen. Deutsch ist eine deutliche Sprache. The German language is limpid. Sie ist bedeutungsvoll. German is full of meaning. The meaning of German in English is closely related. English heißt Englisch, weil es eng mit Deutsch verwandt ist. Many words in German look like many other words in German. Viele Wörter auf Deutsch ähneln viele, vielen anderen Wörtern auf Deutsch. This endows German with a light air of duplicity. Das verleiht dem Deutschen einen leichten Touch der Doppelzungigkeit. Often you write das Leid, but read das Lied. Thank you. Um, and now to, uh, to close out the evening, we're going to have two readings from Yevgenia's diary. Uh, the first is from day three. Uh, the American author, Hannah Bear, will read this excerpt. Hannah, please. Someone. I orient myself in the present because the days offer a little structure. At some point, I visited my parents. Both of them are not ready to leave Kiev. They want to stay here until our moment, until the moment of our victory, as they say. My father is a translator. He translates German poetry into Russian. Thanks to his translations of Paul Salon, I fell in love with this poet when I was still a student. For years, since the Maidan Revolution, he has published his translations almost exclusively in Ukraine. He took part in protests back then. I remember calling him from Berlin and finding out that he was standing with the demonstrators at the parliament building. Then I heard an explosion. Luckily, he wasn't hurt. Now he is in Kiev. He feels quite weak after a long cold and cannot go to the shelter. Maybe he doesn't want to either. Every day I see how he continues to work on his translations, despite the rocket attacks, despite the danger, or maybe because of it. As I write, it occurs to me that during the day I saw many smiling people. For example, a woman who was sitting in the park on a bench next to two big shopping bags. She spoke to me in an absurdly happy voice, saying that she was waiting for her nephew to help her carry the bags home. I'm so happy to have you standing next to me now, talking to me, when there are two of us and less are afraid of the artillery. She used to work as a museum guide at St. Sophia Cathedral, she said, and now she's a pensioner. She told me she is convinced that Ukraine will defeat the Russian invaders. When I think about the frescoes of St. Sophia, I believe that Ukraine will be protected by the whole world. She smiled, tears standing in her eyes. We will win, she said. I didn't know if she was crying more or laughing more, but I felt her courage and admired her. Is today only the third day of the war? 
Mariupol, 58 civilians wounded. Kiev, 35 people, including two children. This is far from a complete list. It feels strange to find myself in this broad, unarmed, almost delicate category, civilians. For a war, a category of people is created who live outside the game. They are shelled, they have to endure the shelling, they are injured, but they do not seem to be able to give an adequate response to it. I don't believe this to be the case. There is something hidden in the smiles that I saw several times today. A secret weapon, a sinister one. And finally, Yelena Aktyorskaya, um, an American novelist born in Odessa, will read today's update to Yevgenia's war diary, which is uh, what she wrote yesterday, so day 11. A way of life that swallows everything. I'm having a hard time concentrating today and getting an overview of what's happening. The war is ongoing and I am somewhere in the midst of the events that are developing chaotically around me. Peacetime seems unattainably far away. New laws and a new reality are unfolding. I receive a utility bill from my Kiev apartment. It is accompanied by a telegram message that sounds like an apology. We are writing to you with a request if your financial means allow under the circumstances, please pay the utilities. Many Kyiv utility workers joined the Ukrainian army and are now fighting for our freedom. However, it is still important to pay the bills. The same text was posted on the Kyiv utilities website. I remembered the faces of the employees of these companies, which are so incompatible with the war. Wherever I look, Everywhere I see war. It has become a total, all-encompassing way of life that swallows everything. During the day, I met an old friend, an historian and sociologist who lives far away on the other side of the city. Early in the morning, he went to the city center to help a friend's mother evacuate. The mother waited at the station with four small bags and a suitcase, even though my friend asked her to bring just one. I heard her voice on the phone, crying as she described the difficulties of boarding the crowded train, then crying again as she explained she had made it onto the train car and found a spot. My friend can't find peace. Yesterday he helped his uncle escape a partially burned out village near Kyiv, and now he's looking for the phone numbers of those who are still there. In this quaint little village called Harenka, the pharmacy was shelled and destroyed on February 28th. Then, at the beginning of March, Harenka was repeatedly shelled again with Grod rockets. Only a few load-bearing walls remain from most of the houses. I have visited several times in the past, but now I do not recognize anything from the pictures of the ruins. In Zaporizhia Oblast, Two postal workers were shot dead in their mail truck while trying to deliver pensions to elderly people who could no longer collect the money themselves. I can picture this kind of Ukrainian mail truck very well. Several times when I was young, I saw postal workers deliver my grandma's pension to her. She was weak and could not leave the apartment, but she was very proud when the small pension, which was rapidly devaluing devaluing due to inflation, was handed to her personally. She was almost friends with one of the postal workers. They always shared a little polite chat, and in my memory, they both looked happy while doing so. Two women who gave each other the gift of their presence and support. The delivery of the pension was a symbol of care. It was a human gesture, more than simply welfare from the corrupt state. I can picture a mail truck 
but picturing how such a truck could be shot at is beyond my imagination. I wish that everyone who delivers something, who cares for someone, reaches their destinations safely tomorrow. That's what I'm hoping for this March 8th. I will be remembering those who, despite the danger to their lives, continue to take care of the people of this country and try to reach someone.